What to do when good friends give you very bad advice. A question about a Hinduism. And warfare that is carved in stone. Carved in stone. All of this and more coming up next. Stay there as Quick Studies begin. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. And welcome to the Quick Study television program. Now, just a brief word of advice. There will be on the graphics that you see on the bottom of the screen, from time to time, a small booklet cover called the Quick Study Pocket Guide. That's the print companion to this program, and we'll talk to you later about how you can receive it. Now, as we go through the Bible in one year, we land today in a passage of Scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 26, through 27. Today we discover when good friends give very bad advice, what do you do? They didn't mean to give bad advice, but the circumstances surrounding David's friends look like David had the perfect opportunity, but it was bad advice. How do you tell the difference? And what do you do when your good friends give you bad advice? We'll talk about that and more a little bit later on. Bible archaeology. What's up? I'm excited about this one. We're jumping into the Assyrian culture a little bit and looking at um, some carvings that help explain ancient warfare that we see in the Bible. Well, that's interesting because mm -hmm. there's all these things we see. Saul's spear stuck into the ground. There's all these objects around. So that's going to be fascinating. Interesting. All right. The Bible challenge, ladies and gentlemen. Can you answer it? Corey's going to have to later. Here we go. <laughs> Where was David's wife Ahinoam from? Jezreel, Carmel, or Gath? All right, that's very interesting. Also mentioned here today, and uh, we'll talk about that and more as we continue. Let's study on. English translations of the Bible have a strange and intriguing history. The so-called Great Bible was published in 1539 with notes taken from the first two English translations, the Cover Bible and, of course, the Matthews Bible. Now, the Archbishop of the Church of England, Thomas Kramer, ordered this translation to be placed in every church. It was so valuable that each Bible was chained to the pulpit of the church pillars to keep it secure. going to focus in a little bit on 1 Samuel chapter 27. Now, a lot of people, this chapter is very shocking to them because what we have is we have David running to Philistine territory. He, he, he starts to camp in Gath. It was a Philistine controlled city. And he begins uh, this really double agent lifestyle. See, the Philistines think that they have this amazing army commander, this, this Judahite, this Israelite army commander working for them. But what he's really doing is he's pretending to work for them all the while plundering their own cities. And this begins really uh, the enmity that occurs between David and the Philistines uh, continuing on in his reign. Well, you and I are going to take a look at one pagan king that demonstrates how brutal the culture of ancient war really was. In history, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, is found not only in the cities left destroyed by his army, but also in the numerous records found in his palace at ancient Nineveh. His record of conquest in Palestine is known today as the Sennacherib Prism. 
beginning in 701 BC, it records the siege of 46 of Judah's fortified cities. This within the reign of King Hezekiah. It speaks of the army moving through Phoenicia and Philistia, squelching rebellions, executing nobles, and displaying their bodies on watchtowers. Recorded also is the siege of Jerusalem. Hezekiah is mentioned by name, but it never records the defeat, agreeing with the biblical account that says Sennacherib failed. Large stone carvings were also found at Sennacherib's palace. The Lashish reliefs record the siege and defeat of the Judahite town. The carving is eight feet tall and 80 feet long. It wrapped around an entire room in the palace. It tells the gruesome details of war, a testimony to the greatness of Sennacherib, a reminder to his nobles, his people, and his enemies that he was indeed a great destroyer. Today we look at 1 Samuel chapter 26 to 27. Let's put that in context through truth text. Now the Ziphites, a culture that lived in the village of Ziph, were informants to Saul about the hideout of David. The word Ziphite means smelters. They seem to have worked with some sort of metallurgy. The Ziphites did not want any trouble with the kingship of Saul, so they quickly concede the location of David the enemy of the soul-sick king. Saul is caught a second time under the power of David, who spares him. The details are in 1 Samuel 26. Chapter 27 show the discouragement of David as he joins forces with the enemy of Israel, the Philistines. This then becomes an upside-down world created by the people's desire to be like other nations around them and have a king, and also Saul's obsession with power. First Samuel 26, verses 1 through 11. Now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hakaliah opposite Jeshimon? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped in the hill of Hakaliah, which is opposite Jeshimon by the road. But David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul had indeed come. So David arose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. Now Saul lay within the camp, and the people encamped all around him. Then David answered and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai the son of Zeruiah, brother of Job, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp, with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and all the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now therefore, please, let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. And David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, Furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please, take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head, and let us go. 1 Samuel 26, verses 1 through 11.
In the account of history of the Bible, there are lessons that are deep and meaningful if we will pay attention to them. Now, those under the influence of evil spirits have short memories, and they take no care in God's covenants. In fact, those under the e influence of evil spirits, authority means nothing to them, and God is only useful if he can be used to make their case. Such was the situation with King Saul, who clearly was under the influence of some kind of demonic spirit. What he promised, what he said about pursuing David before was irrelevant, made irrelevant by his own envy and his own obsession with power. Again, David is given the power of life or death over King Saul as he sleeps. David chooses wisely. He will not take vengeance because that would trespass upon the Lord's territory. Clearly, the Lord has claimed that land of vengeance and says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, Hebrews 10, 30. I can't think of a better time in our history and in our country and in our lives and in our family than to learn these lessons from Scripture all over again. You, beloved, may be in your life struggling with someone who has done you wrong, done you some injustice, hurt you like you never thought you could be hurt in your life, and all you want is vengeance. You want to get even keeps you up at night. But you were not made for such emotions and you were not made for such activity. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, kindness and faith, meekness and self-control. Against such there is no law. And the Bible says in Galatians 5, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not satisfy the lust of the flesh. Now, I want to show you a couple of scriptures here that David gives an example. It is 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 7 through 8. Now, we've already read part of this. So David and Abishai, Abishai came to the people by night. And there he was. He was right there. Saul, the one who hated David, the one who was there to kill David, was sleeping within the camp. You know what? He was sleeping right there with a spear, his own spear stuck in the ground by his head. Well, I mean to tell you, Abner, that was Saul's commander of his army and the people, well, they lay there too. Everybody was asleep. Well, then Abishai says to David, David, you're not going to believe this. God has delivered your enemy into your hand right here to this day. Go for it, man. Go for it. Now, therefore, please let me strike him once. I mean, I'll tell you right now, I'll nail him to the ground, right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him again. I'll kill him the first time. That was the advice of one of David's military men. Well, the advice of loyal friends can be very wrong and against God. Notice here, beloved, that, that David listened to God, and so should we. When it comes to the advice of friends, we should listen to the Word of God above their word. Even if they quote the Word of God to you, you should check it for yourself. What is the Spirit of God speaking to you? Well, the scripture goes on to say, Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Look at that. I want you to see that again. Now, therefore, please let me do it. I'll do it for you. You wouldn't do it before? Okay, I'll do it for you. Let me strike him at once with a spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. I will take his head right off. And David said, You know, don't destroy him. Listen to me, Abishai, who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Truth to live by, number two, the soul, beloved, that is powerful, the soul that is free, the soul that is happy, this is the soul that is guiltless against God. A soul who does not try to take the Lordship for himself but recognizes that Jesus is his Lord and he will conduct his life according to Jesus. Blessed are you when men persecute you and say all matter of evil against you. For great is your reward in heaven, Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. That's a hard lesson, isn't it? 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 10 and 11 say this, David furthermore said this, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him. Let the Lord do it, or his day shall come to die. 
or he shall go out into battle and perish. The Lord God forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please take now the spear and the jug, disarm him that they are by his head and let us go. This is truth to live by number three. Trusting in God means trusting in God to, to deal with your enemies his way, <laughs> not yours. I have failed to see the courts of man, no matter how supreme and mighty they might be, no matter how just and how much they respect liberty, I have failed to see the high courts of any man or the low courts of any man properly deal with the spiritual damage that occurs with injustice. But I have seen the forgiveness of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ operating in our lives, successfully deal with the greatest offense in any believer's life. Jesus is the answer to our problems with justice, not politics. you, but I remember a long time ago, years and years ago, when I was a teenager, and first really read, really read the book of 1 Samuel seriously, and I got to chapter 27 when David appears to be making an alliance uh, with the Philistines in the city of Gath and Ziklag. I, something inside me just went, no, David, don't do it, don't do it, because we, we've seen so far God warning against making alliances with pagan nations. These, it, the Israelites were supposed to be his people and rely only on him. Well, of course, we know that David really was acting as a double agent. He wasn't in league with the Philistines. But that doesn't mean that Israel never made alliances with pagan nations because we know from the rest, uh, from 2 Samuel and from the Kings and Chronicles that there were kings who made alliances with these pagan nations and it never ended well. And that's what God meant when he said, don't do it. Well, you and I are going to take a look at one very destructive pagan alliance, an alliance with Sidon. <laughs> The city of Sidon was built by a natural harbor along the Mediterranean Sea. So Sidonians soon became known for their seafaring abilities and their trade. One of their main exports was purple dye, which they manufactured from a certain species of shellfish. Sidonians were also known for their craftsmanship. Sidon was a pagan city with pagan beliefs. Sidonian princess Jezebel, when she married Israel's King Ahab, brought this pagan worship with her. She even began a systematic removal of God's prophets and true worship from the land. She was responsible for hundreds of murders, leaving a nasty legacy for Sidon in Israel's history. Consequences for Sidon were spoken of in the Bible. And indeed, the city was made subject to Babylon and also to Persia. Today, part of the old city is believed to be underwater. Apparently, a large chunk of it sunk into the ocean following an earthquake in 146 BC. The Bible is a powerful book. We believe it is the Word of God to His creation, and that's why this month Quick Study is excited to offer a special compilation of specific promises and passages in a small, beautifully bound book called A Personal Word from Your Father. Compiled by Ron Hembry, this book is great for meditation and memorization and answers questions like, what do we have in Christ? What does the Bible say about fear, loneliness, anger? And what do I do when I need wisdom and knowledge and much, much more? For your special gift this month, we will send you a copy of this special compilation of Bible passages and promises called A Personal Word from Your Father. Write today. The suggested donation is $15 or more above regular giving. Pray about what God would have you do. 
To write, send to Quick Study, P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, write to Quick Study, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also call and use a credit card at 1-724-733-8336 or in Canada, 519-940-8338. Strange but true. Places. Places. People. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. Ancient scribes record amazing truth. The book of Genesis records that there were large creatures created by God in the sea, in the skies, and even on the earth. The Suez Indians tell of a large flying creature that was struck by lightning during a thunderstorm and fell from the sky. It had claws on its feet and wings, and the wings measured nearly 20 feet across. They call the monster the Thunderbird, but it matches precisely the description of the Pterodon. The tests of God come in severe form they can often involve the temptation to claim the attributes of God, like Satan did for ourselves, as told in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. One of the most powerful proclamations of King David was made before he ever was a king. The question is asked of his military advisor, who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Now, in this passage, David shows that violation against God's ways is a man-made choice. But that choice brings with it the responsibility of its condition on man. Qualification for leadership in God's kingdom is a series of choices made with the advice of God's word, not by the feelings or the reasonings of man's conventional wisdom. Choice has a voice. How we choose demonstrates our love for God or our lack of love for God. Now, this is very interesting to me because David has all of this opportunity in front of him to destroy Saul. And by all means, you've done your study on that yesterday. This would be a good opportunity to seize the kingdom and take the kingship. But he chooses not to. He restrains himself. Why? Because of the anointing of the Lord. Not because of Saul's character. Not because Saul didn't hate him, but because David recognized and respected the anointing of God, that is sadly lacking in leadership today. Not, not all, but in much of leadership today, we have turned to the vices and the advices of men rather than respecting the anointings of God. Mm -hmm. God has his choices of men and women that he chooses for his own reasons. And we would do well not to attack, not to malign, but to be still and know that he is Lord. And believe me, uh, we've said it many times, God could choose somebody else other than us. that would probably be, do a lot better than choosing people like us. could probably choose somebody better. But anyway, that's the way God did it. So here we have a, another example, Corey, of how David's heart was different than the hearts of the other kings mm -hmm. that surrounded him. Very interesting, isn't it? it? It was, and that was also part of my study today. We we looked at the historical implications, what happened when Israelite kings tried to make alliances with pagan nations, what God had warned against. And uh, we see, of course, in our reading today how David didn't do that. It appears at first as if he's making a coalition with the Philistines, but he's actually not. He's mm -hmm. actually being a double agent. He did what his, uh, his uh, ancestors after him uh, would not be able to do. This great scene where uh, he's he's with Abishai and, and he's and and the, the 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 man says this is it this is it this is the opportunity this is it and the Bible says nothing about what David said at that moment. It only says the next thing he did, mm -hmm. which was to take the water and the pitcher and so on and, and get out of there. And I find that interesting because David didn't try to defend his position. He didn't try to excuse or explain what he was doing. He recognized the man of war that he was next to probably wouldn't understand it. 
but he just did it. He led by example. And there, here, here again, we have a great image of a king. By all means, he wasn't perfect and he made a lot of mistakes, but when he made the mistakes, he knew where to go. Mm -hmm. who knew, he knew who had the mercy and he knew what to do. Very interesting. And God chose David because of his heart. Indeed. And this, this is, of course, uh, the, what I think accelerated the anointing of David was that, because Saul had the kingly anointed, but then David did too. But what, what accelerated David's anointing was his heart for God. That's right. And uh, which, by the way, we don't really see that with Solomon. We see Solomon's heart to be wise, but mm -hmm. not a heart for God. And that gets him in trouble in the end. Very interesting. Yes. Corey, do you know anything about the Bible? I sure hope so. I've been trying. I've been studying a lot. So. All right. We have the Bible challenge and Janice has prepared it for us. So what is it? Well, where was David's wife Ahinoam from? Was she from Jezreel, Carmel, or Gath? What do you think, Corey? She was from the valley, the Jezreel Valley. She was indeed. She's she a valley was girl? a Jezreelitess. She's a valley yeah. girl. All right, very good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And where does that come from? What's the scripture reference? 1 Samuel 27, verse 3. All the Bible challenges are in the scriptures we read. Now, in a moment, we're going to be showing you Watch and Pray. And we want you to join with us for the folks who've written in so that we can pray together. There's power in agreement. But would you agree with me to pray for Quick Study Television in our financial difficulties? I would appreciate the prayer of the partners. We are having some difficulties financially. The income is down. And so if you would be kind enough to pray about what God would have you do, I would appreciate that. God will rescue. He always does. Here's Watch and Pray. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. These are the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. If you today need rest for your soul, I encourage you to come to Jesus Christ. You know, you can buy all the self-help book you want. You can buy, you know, believe in yourself, believe in that, believe in this, believe in the universe, call on the secret. It's not going to work. But your creator, that's a different story. His name is Jesus Christ, Hebrew, Yeshua HaMashiach. He is Christ the Messiah, and he invites you to come to him today. And when you do that, it's not religion. Um, in fact, Jesus was quite perturbed at the religious people of his day. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I, Jesus Christ, will give you rest. Pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose again, and I come to you today. I need some rest. Help me, Lord. And if you're serious, he will do so. Thank you for joining us today on the Quick Study Television program. Remember that you can find out more about us at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And we are supported by faithful viewers just like you. If you'd like a copy of the Quick Study Pocket Guide, you can find out more information at www.BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com.